First time for us to come to the Word of God, and uh, we are grateful that uh, God's Word come to us, His people, in all seasons of life, in prosperity, in joy, in growth, uh, but it's also come to us in time of trouble, challenges, and pain. And we understand that uh, God speaks to His people, uh, speak to us in a special way, sometimes whisper, sometimes shouting, especially in time of trouble and pain. He speaks in the voice that uh, we have to pay uh, utmost, uh, utmost attention so that uh, we can hear what he has to say and understand uh, the message, uh, especially in this uh, situation of our life and of our church. So as you know, we are in a new situation for our church and uh, other churches as well uh, are suspending meeting, uh, only online services. So we have... Uh, online worship, but it is still worship, still together as a church family, uh, and I think that even more so, we uh, are aware, uh, well aware of, uh, of the connections and the need to be connected. Uh, so we still, uh, at, at 9 a.m., as you know, prepare with the family, with Bible, uh, prayer for the day, and with the spirit of reverence, we come to the Word, come to the worship, offering up our praise and obedience and our offering, and then we come together in the connections at uh, 11 a.m. and all members call in uh, to connect to uh, their group members and uh, learn lessons, share obedience, uh, uh, pray for one another and show love and uh, just uh, be uh, together uh, as, a, uh, as a family, as a church. And again, if you are not part of a group, join one, uh, be a part of the family. It is not primarily about us when we come together as a group. It's for others and it's for the work and the, for the mission of the church. So we will continue to worship God, to walk in God's word, and serve God together as a church family uh, for the glory of God and for the glory of his Christ in season and out of season, regardless of external circumstances. So that leads me to the decision that we will continue First Corinthians study from where we left off, even for and especially for times like this. Now many pastors, many churches would choose a topic or a theme to speak into the situation of change, uh, to bring special encouragement and comfort to the people, uh, and that is very appropriate. Uh, we are currently learning God's word in uh, the epistle of 1 Corinthians, as we are engaging in the exposition of God's word as a habit of our church, uh, we learn that God's word, uh, as it is properly proclaimed and accurately interpreted, will speak into the lives of God's people where they are, transcending their immediate circumstances and seasons of life. So the text that we have before us, Corinthians 4, that uh, we just heard proclaimed to us, speaks of the burdens of the spiritual man. So we ask the question, who is a spiritual man? How do we identify a spiritual man uh, and woman uh, and persons uh, in the church? What are his marks uh, in times of troubles, facing the challenges of life and ministry? Uh, what uh, a spiritual man to do? Now that is directly relevant to the current situation and, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, circumstances that we face uh, right now of uncertainty and chaos. In our situation now, we want to be the spiritual man and the woman uh, that God wants us to be. Not focusing on our needs and worries and concerns, but focus on being pleasing to God, faithful to Him, to His Word, and effective for the work of the kingdom, reaching out to the dark world that needs Christ. So what are we to do as God's people and as individual disciples of Christ in the current situation we find ourselves in? And we ask this question for God and for the church and for the world. What are we to do as God people? And in this text, uh, we have the answers. We see the marks of a, a spiritual man. We see that, uh, that in, in times of trouble, you reprove, you beget, you model, you discipline. That's the situation in the current church. They are facing trouble, um, maybe more inward, the, rather than outward, but uh, they fa face challenges and, and, and uh, uh, attacks 
uh, in the very special way and uh, Paul talking to them and give them the principle of behavior of conduct and of care and of character and of relationship of ministry service and commitment uh, so that uh, we also see that in us uh, as God's people in his family even in these special times or especially in these trouble and special times so we will focus to hear what God wants us to say to each and every one of us and we commit to obey and to change and to walk in obedience and transformation to be pleasing to Christ and to bring Him glory. And that is how we deal with special time of trouble time. And when that's how we deal with special needs in our life and the life of our church. So we look into this uh, text and the immediate context uh, is Paul writing to the Corinthians uh, on their sorry condition, on their trouble uh, church in uh, the uh, uh, in the effectiveness of their life and uh, call for the need of immediate change in their lives and in their church. So we will co connect to the flow and track uh, the text. So again, we see uh, in the outline um, the marks of a spiritual man uh, as the burdens of a spiritual man show in the way that he works out uh, in, the, in time of trouble, in time of challenges. You reprove, you beget, you model, you discipline. Let's come to God. Lord, in times like this, we come to you and come to your word. And we are so appreciative that your word come to us uh, with light, with uh, power, also with discipline, with comfort, but also with uh, correction. And come to us uh, so that we can come to you and become more and more like you. So speak to us now. Uh, in our situation where we are so that we can respond to you and walk in obedience before your word and to bring you honor and glory and transformation in our life and in our world. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you know, we, uh, we're in uh, chapter 4 and in order to understand what I'm talking about today, uh, we may need uh, or you may need to uh, review uh, the, the lessons that come before that and we have the review uh, um, more extensively but I'll just uh, touch uh, quickly on uh, the idea uh, that we put before us or, or the lesson that uh, Paul put before us that uh, on the spiritual delusion that the Corinthian church uh, are find, uh, have uh, found themselves in and uh, to overcome the spiritual delusion we, uh, we talk about uh, we must not exceed what is written, we must not forget what is given, we must not oppose what is entrusted. And that, uh, and that uh, uh, you, you can see in, uh, <clears throat> in verse 6 uh, to verse 13. Uh, we won't have time to go into the detail, but let me just say that uh, the first one, the delusion, has to do with the place of the word in our life. Uh, so, so Paul said, now uh, uh, these things... Brethren, uh, I have figuratively applied myself and Apollos for your sake so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written so that uh, no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. So he's saying that, uh, that uh, they are living an unreal and untrue uh, with a lot of presumptions in their life. They live above the word. And what he means by that is that they uh, live independent of the word. At this, uh, while claiming to believe in the word, claiming it is the word of God with authority over their life, but when it comes to decision and come to value system and come to uh, life pursuit, they do uh, according to what they want. They put themselves, they put their desire, they put their emotion above the word. And how do we see that? He, he said, well, look into your relationship. Uh, and he pointed out that, uh, that with, with them, with Apollos and himself, uh, in the relationship with the, with the church, uh, the, they put themselves above the word. So there's division and strife and personal preferences or opinions uh, in the church. There's uh, judgment on others. And, and he said, uh, uh, you presume on that, you presume on the authority of Christ. Only Christ can examine uh, the heart of people. Only Christ can disclose the motive of man's heart. Uh, only him can bring the light uh, uh, in uh, shining in the hidden things uh, of the heart. 
but you presume on that. Why? Because you put yourself above the word. And the, the trouble is, uh, you think it's okay. You think uh, it is uh, just a normal course of how you behave. No, it is not okay. It is a delusion. It is uh, the is, uh, uh, um, disregarding and neglect uh, of the God's word. So uh, we have to understand that when we put ourselves above the word, we live in a uh, uh, we live out the lies, and we are unreal and we are untrue. Then he moved to the next uh, foundation, and that is the, the matter uh, of value system of life. He's talking about the system of grace, uh, system of works. Uh, that is, uh, we must not forget what is given. Verse 7. For who regards you as superior, what uh, do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? So the, he asked three questions to really flush out the, the value system uh, or demand that they face the true value system in their lives and in their heart. They be in us. And so we have been confronted. Uh, and, and he said, uh, do you uh, compare yourself with others? Uh, for who regard you as superior? Uh, why is it that uh, you uh, still base your life on merit and compare uh, with one another as to who's better and who's worse? Uh, when you do that, when you look at yourself in comparison to others, uh, what it displays or what it betrays is that you are not operating on the system of grace and the value of grace, but it is uh, the work system, the marriage system that you base yourself on. So, so he said, uh, now look at grace. Uh, if you ask this question uh, and you answer properly, you know uh, that, uh, that the foundation is clear. It must be grace. What do you have that you did not receive? Well, a very simple question. And uh, as uh, Christians in relationship with Christ, we say that there's nothing that we have that we did not receive. So we don't deserve what we receive. And therefore, there's no comparison on what we have received, except that uh, we will show gratitude and thanksgiving and praise before God. That is the attitude. We don't compare, and we are always thankful and grateful. So he said, uh, let me make sure that you understand that. So uh, um, if, you did, uh, if you did receive it, then why do you boast as if you had not received it? Uh, if you still put yourself in the center, if you still look at yourself as the lens, uh, primary lens uh, uh, and the focus uh, for uh, life in connection to the world and in your relationship, then uh, you're not looking at uh, the cross of Christ, then you're not looking at, at grace, you're not looking at uh, uh, what God has done, but you're looking at yourself. So he said that, uh, again, look into your relationship, your decision, how you make that, and you will see whether you exceed the word, uh, put yourself above the word, whether you're in the, the work system or the grace system. And then uh, he asked this question. Uh, actually, he uh, dis de de described the, uh, the value system that works out in the mission and the purpose of a person. So he said that uh, people are living out the lies uh, even when they are in the church because uh, we are given a mission, we are given a purpose to live, but our life may uh, show very clearly that we are opposed to what is entrusted to us. So to overcome the spiritual delusion, we must not oppose to what is entrusted to us. And that's what he said in verse 8 to verse 13. He described the life that is inconsistent, uh, that is uh, incompatible, that is in opposition to the calling and the mission of the Christian life. So there's a lifestyle that we must embrace, and that is the lifestyle of servant and steward and witnesses and uh, people that are sent out and commissioned for the work of Christ. So he said, uh, but your attitude is that you already feel, we say, that you have already become rich, you have become kings without us, and indeed I wish that you had become kings so that we also might reign with you. Uh, so he said, uh, you, you live out your value system, you live out your heart desire, uh, and it show up in your lifestyle, and, and it is just totally different from the lifestyle that we are called to do, that we are called to live, uh, very uh, opposite to the value system 
that we must live for God. So he said, uh, well, what is the system that we must live for God? What is the lifestyle that we must have? Well, uh, how do we conduct ourselves? He said, look at, uh, look at the apostle, look at us. Because verse 9, he said, God has exhibited us, apostle, last of all, as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle of the world, both angels and two men. We, have, we go into detail uh, in the lesson here, so I just want to uh, uh, sum up that God uh, display the model of life that we must follow. And he said, look at the life of the apostle. Uh, and, and, and the Corinthians said, no, uh, we already feel. Uh, and the apostle asked, uh, what, do, uh, what are you filled with? What, what do you find your satisfaction in? Uh, because uh, the, the, the people of God always hunger uh, for righteousness and thirst for his righteousness and then in that context uh, they may be filled. Uh, and they said, uh, well you have become rich. You have become rich yourself already. You have arrived, you have no more needs. And then he said, you have become king. You have uh, become glory. Uh, you have entered into glory uh, and already without pain. You have obtained the cross, uh, the, the crown without the cross. So he said, look at uh, that life, look at your expectation, look at uh, what you want and define uh, for, for, for your life. And, and he said, uh, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. Uh, you, you are t different from the model that God put up for you to follow. Uh, and so you cannot presume that, uh, that you live uh, the truth. Uh, it shows that you live the lie, the untruth. You are in delusion. And so uh, to this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty. We are poorly clothed. We are roughly treated and are homeless. We toy working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. And when we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world and dregs of all things even until now. As we talk about this, and we have to pause and say, uh, does our life show a lifestyle of those who live for the mission for God, who live with the purpose of God, who live for the kingdom of God? But you want to see the progression here. First, you neglect the word. You put yourself above the word. You live independent of the word. And what happened is that you move yourself out of the system of grace into the system of works. Like the world, uh, you live like the world. You live like the pagans. And therefore, you have no mission. You achieve nothing for God. You don't live for the kingdom because you miss out this understanding that we are called for God's work. So when, uh, when we wrong in uh, relationship with the word, we were wrong in the relationship with grace, and we will be wrong in the relationship with our mission and our focus. So Paul called for change. He, he, he called for change, and, and he wanted us to understand that change must come. Now, how does change come? Um, how, how do people in the church, uh, and that means us, uh, uh, embrace the transformation that is available to us? So he's, now he's pointing out that, uh, that, uh, that uh, it requires a certain kind of heart, certain kind of people, certain kind of a channel that got put in the church, and that is uh, the spiritual man. That is, uh, that uh, those who are mature, uh, used by God, uh, live for God, and, 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 and they will bring reproof, and they will bring spiritual birth, they will give example, and they will bring discipline into the church. And, and, and those are the marks of this, a spiritual man, and also we will see that uh, they are the burdens that he carry and live out. So let's start on that, uh, uh, the, on the lesson burdens of a, a spiritual man, and we'll look at the first uh, the first point uh, that uh, you reprove, uh, verse 14, I do not write this in to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. So Paul said, I do not write this in to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. So the first mark of a spiritual man when dealing with uh, a weak and uh, immature church is the work of correction and much uh, uh, reproof uh, of the people. It's a mark that we don't often see in our relationship with one another and very rarely see in the church. 
It requires a solid relationship. It requires that we know one another. It requires that we, uh, in uh, a kind of relationship, uh, that we're able to confront and uh, show faults uh, that you see in uh, the lives of those you love. Uh, we often see complaints. We often see uh, criticism. We hear a lot about negative uh, opinions. Uh, and we see a uh, wrong attitude in the church, but we need to see the work of the spiritual reproof and correction in terms of how we uh, motivate one another to live for God. So we look at the spiritual burden here. Uh, that's what Paul wants to, uh, to show. So in the ways that Paul deals with the problem in the church uh, at Corinth, we see who the Corinthians are, and we see the reality of their faith, or actually the lack of it, but we also see Paul as who he is, and the true love that he has for the Corinthian church. We see in dealing with them, he shows his own marks of, uh, of uh, spirituality. We see his burden and pain and patience with the church. Now remember for uh, all the chapter before us, the uh, fourth chapter we have been studying, Paul has been clearly dealing strongly with the Corinthians. He really unloaded on them against uh, carnality. He uh, speaks strongly against their, their pride. Uh, he attacked their love for human wisdom. He, uh, he showed that their split and quarrels uh, is uh, detrimental to the church. So they were fractured into division and uh, Paul really confronted them on that. And then at the end of the passage that we read uh, uh, from the verse 8 to verse 13, he became very sarcastic uh, because he would want to penetrate their defense, so to speak, uh, and they uh, must hear him. Um, so uh, 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 he continued to, uh, to say strong things to them, but uh, here he paused in verse uh, 14 to verse 21. He uh, wanted to tell them why he is so stern uh, to them, why he is so tough, why he feels that he must speak uh, uh, to them with such uh, strong conviction. It is because uh, he has relationship with them as their father spiritually, and he must reprove them. So we want to look at this reproof. So we continue to listen uh, to the conversation, and as we do so, uh, we see uh, the Apostle Paul and the Christian at Corinth engage, uh, and we too engage and involved in the conversation. Uh, in the way that uh, we hear uh, what Paul is speaking to them, and then also in the by extension speaking directly to us. But also we want to uh, understand the emotion and the pain that, uh, 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 that exists in this relationship and uh, how that impacts us. Now Paul is pouring out his heart to the Corinthians and you can see the, his emotion uh, swinging from pain to exasperation down to being very sarcastic uh, and disbelief and just a, a total uh, uh, surprise in the way uh, at the condition of his people. Uh, he, he writes, uh, verse 14, I, I don't want to do this. Uh, I'm not writing uh, this to shame you, but I need to bring it up and I need to deal with that with you. So Paul connects to what he just said uh, previously uh, to clarify his purpose for such forceful instruction. Uh, so we need to understand Paul's emotion in regard to the Corinthians because uh, Paul is uh, writing to his people. He's talking to the people he loved, the people he know. He's talking to his family, to his church, to his students uh, and tell them that their behavior, their attitude um, betrays a, a path to destruction that is lying right ahead of them. Uh, so he's coming hard down on them. He's telling them that they are Christian without clothes, like the people in the church of Laodicea mentioned by Jesus uh, in Revelation 3, that they are miserable, they are wretched, they are naked, but they think they are rich and they think they are okay. Um, as the emperor with no clothes in the children's story, uh, we see ourselves and the people at Corinth facing that situation. So the people at Corinth uh, imagine a spiritual condition uh, of their life that is totally disconnected from reality. They are not where they claim to be or where, where they think they, they are. 
they are living in sin, uh, but they talk holiness. They are immature and they are weak, but they are talking about strength and sufficiency. They assert uh, victory, uh, they deny suffering, uh, they, uh, uh, they, their voice uh, struggle with sin, uh, they claim a faith that has no impact in life. And, and so Paul said, you already feel, you already come rich, you have become kings without us. Uh, I wish it is reality, but it is not. I wish indeed that you had become kings so that we also may reign with you. But you are not kings, you are not rich, you are you're not filled. You are hungry. But again, if, if, you, if we ask you that you will say that you're okay. We are full for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. So the, this, uh, this connection to reality here is total for the church. They even claim to be better than the apostle. They don't feel like they need Paul's instruction anymore. They feel that they are independent of uh, of uh, the authority from uh, scripture and authority from uh, uh, the apostle. Uh, they are free to do what they want to do, they say what they feel like, uh, satisfy themselves in ways that uh, 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 a very selfish person would focus on. And so Paul painted the picture uh, of a very different experience and called them uh, to, to, uh, to, to see that uh, uh, their life is uh, in contradiction to what they're supposed to be. So uh, we, 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 we see that again in uh, verse 11 to 13. Uh, but what does it mean for us? I think the significance of this disconnection is very great uh, in connection to us. Because if we are honest, and we must be, uh, we identify more with uh, our belief uh, and behavior to the delusion of the Corinthians than with the experience of the apostles. Um, uh, uh, the Corinthians claim to believe uh, and how they live their lives uh, in reality is very much the same uh, in our everyday living in the week that we say uh, different uh, on what we say on Sunday or, or maybe even different on what we say every day and the way we live it out. Our experience uh, every day um, uh, it's very different from what we say uh, by uh, claiming to have faith. So for example, what we say about the Bible and what we do with it is a uh, very clear disconnection and a delusion in many cases. So do you believe in the Bible of God? We say, sure, I believe in the Bible as the Word of God. Do you love it? Do you read it? Uh, do you obey what it said? Well, the answer is, uh, I don't know. What we say about the cross and the direction of our lives are very uh, often opposite to what the reality is. Um, uh, so we, we answer that I understand that I need to carry my cross daily and follow Christ and that uh, in dying, uh, dying daily with Him. Uh, uh, but uh, as soon as somebody hurts me a little bit, I scream murder. If my circumstances don't line up the way I want, uh, or if anything even appears to threaten my well-being, or my house, or my job, or my family, um, I cry murder, I resent, I uh, protest, and I demand that God has the duty to intervene, uh, with miracles no less, to guarantee my happiness. So as we look into our situation right now uh, with the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, situation, uh, do we look uh, to see the difference between the Christian response uh, to the situation than those who are in the world? Do we show faith in our response? Do we show God in our response? Do we make any difference in the way that we respond uh, to the situation that we find ourselves in? Do we show that uh, we understand the difference between the temporary world that uh, passing away and the eternal uh, value that we must pursue for God and for the kingdom. Uh, is that uh, self that we're focusing on, or is it mission and kingdom that we're talking about? So, 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 so Paul saying that, um, you must be uh, uh, honest and you must face reproof because that's how God wants you to understand. So it is the thinking uh, that we have in our value system as we, as we face uh, the circumstances that we need to be changed. 
so Paul here, uh, he, uh, he wants to uh, connect with the people in a uh, tender way, so he kind of changed his tone and he uh, uh, wants them to understand that uh, he loves them and he wants uh, them to uh, relate to the truth that uh, uh, they need to process. Now Paul deals straight with the problem, he's not sweeping things under the carpet, but in dealing with the problem of the Corinthians, we can see the burden of his, uh, of his heart. We can see the burden of this spiritual man. So what Paul has to say is not in the spirit of, you know, take it or leave it, uh, but uh, in terms of relationship, in terms of love and care. Uh, he said uh, uh, that you may find that I'm stern uh, and in your face and confrontational, um, and uh, at times are you authority, uh, as well as uh, irony and sarcasm to communicate with you, but uh, you must understand that I always, always have love and deep concern for you and enduring care for you. So that's what Paul wants to communicate because uh, he said that uh, I am not writing this to shame you. Uh, after bringing the Corinthians to task and, and show them the immaturity and delusion and conceit, uh, Paul probably just, uh, you know, take a little break and reread the lines that he just wrote and he pray out loud, you know, Lord, this is quite strong, isn't it? You know, it's, 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 it's very scathing. It's going right uh, to the jugular vein. And, and, uh, but I'm confident that this is exactly what you want me to say to, to my people. Um, but then he wants to sit down and he writes the next few lines where we are right now to share the burden of his heart. It is not to shame them, he said. It's not to shame you that I, that I want. It's not my purpose to hurt you, even though it might require that. I write to warn you, I want you to know the truth. So Paul is not uh, trying to explain away what he just told them. Uh, he's not like some parents, you know, after the, the, the discipline in the, the, their kids, they feel so bad, and so they try to make up. Now Paul is not apologizing for the tough word that he uses. He is sure the Corinthians, if they have any tenderness or sensitivity in their heart, would uh, be full of shame in response. Now we must understand that shame is a very powerful sense of guilt and uh, we are afraid of uh, being exposed to the reality uh, that we desperately try to hide. But it is a useful emotion, it's a useful state of mind. Uh, the opposition or the opposite of shamelessness, which is a condition of insensitivity to the point uh, where you know you no longer feel the guilt or the wrong uh, or, or the need to hide the wrong things that you do. That is a problem and we see that in our world today. So a little bit of shame now and then can do you quite a bit of good even though it is not Paul's attention for them to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, have to deal with. <clears throat> but we want to uh, also uh, um, uh, affirm at the place of shame. <clears throat> In the relationship with the believers, uh, there are times Paul will set out to call people to shame, to confront them with the unrighteousness of their life, to demand that they face up with reality, to uh, deal with the shame and to change. So, so, he, so he said that even though we are very hesitant to do that, but we feel that this kind of instruction and uh, information uh, uh, need to be in the church. Uh, people don't feel uh, like that or respond to that. But uh, uh, we, 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 we know that the Bible is not unclear about the position on bringing people face to face with the issue lovingly. Uh, of course, when we bring them to face with the issue, but uh, we are not going to stop peddling uh, and, and, be, and make uh, murky the standard of God and uh, make that unconvincing. So Paul point out that there are times uh, shame need to be brought uh, into the focus. Uh, the second uh, Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 14, uh, he said, If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him, do not associate with him in order that he might feel ashamed. 
So he said that those who are disobedient among you, put them to shame. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 5, he said, I said this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? You know, believers are taking uh, one another, uh, take uh, each other, sue, suing one another in court. And Paul said, uh, that is a shameful thing. I want to point that out and I want to make sure that you feel the shame. I say, I say this to shame you. And then it was uh, 34 of chapter 15, 1 Corinthians. He said, come back to your senses as you are and stop sinning. For there are some of you who are ignorant of God. I said this to your shame. So, so he said that uh, uh, in your church, in your community of faith, some of you act like you don't have any faith. Uh, you are even ignorant of God. You don't know who God is. And I want you to feel shame on that. I want you to uh, deal with that and not just uh, ignore it. So I mentioned uh, shamelessness as a condition of the heart uh, and of the mind that is so callous uh, that you don't feel the guilt anymore. God has, complained, uh, God has a complaint against his people because uh, of their attitude concerning sin. And what should people feel when they commit sin? And what should uh, the proper attitude be when you know that you have done wrong? Well, shame. Uh, and shame leads to repentance. But this is uh, the Lord said to, uh, about his people in Jeremiah 8, verse 12. Jeremiah 8, verse 12. He said, are they ashamed uh, of their loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. So they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down where they are, uh, when they are punished, said the Lord. So, so he said, they are so insensitive to sin uh, the, that, uh, that uh, the, they are not ashamed of their loathsome conduct. They, they have no shame at all. And, and he used this phrase, they do not even know how to blush. They do not even know how to blush. And, and, and he said, so they will fall among the fallen and they will be brought down. So when a person loses sensitivity to, uh, to, to sin and to guilt, he is done, uh, spiritually speaking, he will fall among the fallen. So as we uh, 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 deal with this, uh, we can just stop here and we could talk about many things we do or not do that bring us a deep shared sense of guilt uh, and of shame. But yet, uh, if we are honest to ourselves and we look at the condition, um, we don't feel anything. Uh, for example, prayerlessness in our life. We know about that, but we don't feel any compulsion to change. Lateness uh, or biblical illiteracy uh, or immaturity and complacency. Uh, we are facing a real problem that face, uh, the, the people of God face before us. And that is we have not even, that, uh, that we don't even know how to blush. So let's, let's say sleeping in church or taxing uh, while you're in church or reading email, uh, surfing the net. And we do all that and, uh, and we treat that as a very trivial matter. But should we treat this as a matter of normal behavior uh, or something that we ought to blush uh, when we catch ourselves doing it? So we don't want to lose the sensitivity to God's presence and we don't want to hear him said about us in the different areas of our life. They have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. So, so Paul brings that uh, reproof to the, to the church. So he said that even though there, um, there's a need for it uh, in the Corinthian church, he has n not the purpose to bring them to shame, but to change. Uh, but uh, but uh, the purpose of shame is uh, also change. And so he uh, tells them that he's taking them to that level because uh, uh, if the, the uh, given choice, uh, what would they prefer to do? So in uh, verse 21, chapter 4, he said, What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a whip or a rod or in love and with gentle spirit? He said, Now you want to deal with shame or you want to deal with truth and love? Uh, so, uh, so that is how he admonished them. And he said to admonish is uh, to warn them. 
Uh, so, so the word that, uh, that he used, I do not write this in to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Uh, so admonish is, uh, is to uh, the, say, the, uh, to put the things in mind, uh, to uh, presuppose that something is wrong, and the intention is to correct and to make right, uh, to change the way one thinks and change the way one decides to put in mind the right stuff and to effect the right behavior. So this is a very strong part of the ministry, the work of the Word in the church. Uh, and Paul actually summarizes his own teaching and preaching and training uh, work in the church at Ephesus for three years as a ministry of warning, as a ministry of reproof, exhorting uh, for the purpose to, uh, to change and want people to come uh, to uh, the right relationship with God. So in Acts 20, um, verse 31 and 32, uh, Acts 20, 31, 32, he said that be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each one of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So he said that uh, for three years, uh, 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 for uh, night and day, uh, I confront you, I reprove you, I admonish you. So, so uh, what it is uh, pointing out too, it points out uh, the burden that he has in his heart, the burden of a, a, a spiritual man here to help people to change, to follow God, to be right with God, is a burden for Paul. It is in his heart, it is constantly in his thinking, it is an urgent uh, and stirring issue uh, in him. For three years I never stopped warning each one of you night and day with tears. And this is the burden that God people must have with, uh, for one another uh, as we look into the text and apply it to ourselves. Because this is where your concern for God's glory and your love for your brothers and sisters uh, intersect. Uh, you know, all people by nature care for themselves um, uh, and they have uh, burdens and concern uh, for their loved ones. But a spiritual person by his new nature will care uh, for his uh, spiritual well-being for sure, but also the spiritual well-being of others, uh, his loved ones, uh, uh, his family, but also more than that, ought to be more than that. It is a concern and the burden for the church. It is uh, the burden and concern for God's people. And uh, we see it very clearly here in the life of Paul. Now the fact that a person cares only for himself uh, and, and uh, only for his immediate family tells us of his maturity and relationship with God uh, or not, or his immaturity and his lack of relationship with the Lord. So the person who is close to God, who is spiritual, will reflect God's heart with a strong desire to see people he knows in good uh, relationship to God. Now that uh, from relationship to unbelievers, uh, his friends, to believers in the church, he has a burden to see that they have good relationship to God. Now any of us who are parents, uh, we know that we have burden for our children. Uh, we want what is right for them their schooling, their relationship, their development, their career, their faith. Now that's normal, but let me ask you this question. What area of the development that is primary concern to you? Uh, if you look back to your instruction to your children, what area will stand out uh, as your primary concern? Uh, do you deal with the spiritual area in their lives uh, with the same passion and conviction about their relationship, their schooling, and their career. You know, many parents will put schooling first, and then boy-girl relationship is second, and then somewhere down the list, uh, something about God and something about the church. Clearly not a priority at all. And guess what? The kids live it out. They live it out, the same concern that we have, the same value system that we show. So Paul is deeply concerned about the spiritual well-being of the Corinthians, not just surface stuff, uh, because uh, on the surface things look just fine. Uh, he is concerned that the Corinthians are not living a spiritual delusion, thinking they are good while they are really bad. 
uh, thinking that they are hot, but they are just lukewarm, thinking that they are fine, but in reality they are destitute, naked and blind. Now we can see uh, this application uh, clearly, which is asked a very simple question. Is there somebody you have a burden for? Uh, is there somebody that you are praying for and thinking about and following up uh, when uh, he or she is not in church? Uh, that you be checking on uh, to see if they have a proper relationship with Christ and, uh, and that uh, you make it your business that uh, someone will grow in uh, both life and in the Lord. Uh, now, uh, do you see signs of problems in the, the heart of people? Do you uh, take it as a, as a matter of great personal concern? So, you know, these questions uh, expose us uh, to uh, where we are uh, uh, because we may be living this life totally oblivious to the conditions and the needs of others only uh, know uh, of ourselves and our family and primary you know along the things of this world well, we we don't think that it is our job we think it's uh, that the job belongs to somebody else you know the pastor or somebody maybe but uh, we are called to connect to this kind of life, and Paul said it must show um, <clears throat> that, uh, that uh, the, the direction of our lives must be to connect to people in the spiritual uh, condition of their lives and bring them before the Lord. Uh, we need to feel that burden of others. Uh, we need to feel alarm, uh, and we don't want to travel to this life uh, as if nothing mattered to us except our own skin. So in Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, Paul said, We urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. Uh, he said, uh, this ought to be your life. It ought to be a part of you, uh, because it is. Uh, Paul does not say that you have to be a pastor to do this. Uh, he is saying that you do this regardless of where you are, uh, 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 whether you have a pastor or not. This is the common responsibility uh, in the church between each one uh, to the others. Why do we care about that? Why do we do about that? So Paul said, uh, because of love. Uh, so he uh, pointed out the motive, why we do this. Thing. Um, he, so, so he said, uh, uh, to the Corinthians, um, that he loves them, that he cares deeply for them. I do not write this in to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. This matter of reproof and exhortation and instruction has to be done in the context of love and relationship. So failure to correct the spiritual wrongs can be very tragic. Uh, we have responsibility over another believer, especially if we are looked up uh, uh, as uh, older brothers, or uh, older sister, or uh, leaders of uh, ministry, uh, leaders uh, in the church. But that doesn't mean that we have a license uh, as older people to just uh, pipe up our personal grievances or opinions and criticism over the people. Paul will not have any of that. Uh, he said that it's a condition, and he lays it down, and he said that admonish you as my beloved children. It is the love and relationship, as we will see uh, in the next uh, few points, uh, that uh, give us the ability to connect and the ability to correct. Um, uh, so there must be general, genuine life of faith, uh, genuine, genuine life of connection and love that give you the right to speak into the situation. But wrong behavior must be changed. Wrong beliefs must be corrected. Uh, it is uh, done with uh, uh, care and with love by faithful and godly people. Um, and they have the burden of care and love and concern for others uh, as their own children. So Paul points out this connection very clearly. He said, as my own children. The connection of a genuine life of faith before the Lord and the genuine love and care to what God's people. It has to be real on both sides because otherwise nothing we say will matter except more hurt and more resentment and problems. 
So Paul pointed that out in uh, First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. He said, you are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy and righteous and blameless we were among you who believe. For you know what we dealt with, each one of you as a father dealt with, as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So he said, uh, you must confront people uh, to the truth, and you must uh, hold them accountable uh, to God's grace. But the, perhaps there is a problem right here that we must understand. Uh, the, there's a reason why we... Uh, we do not carry the burden for God's people and to bring them to be right with Christ. Because number one, we must be real first. That we must believe first. That we must practice first. Uh, so, so he said, you are witnesses. And so it's God how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believe. So he said, uh, you, you look at us and you know how we live. Uh, we, uh, we are real. We are... We have faith, we have righteousness, we live blamelessly before you. And so we were not saying that do what we say and not what we do. We say follow us and be imitators of us. So first, uh, if you're not real, then you cannot correct people. If you are not uh, by faith, in faith, um, then you're not uh, going to encourage people to move in the area of faith. But then secondly, there's a connection in terms of relationship and that must be in place uh, so that we can connect to people and make corrections in their life. For you know that we dealt with you and each of you as a father deals with his own children encouraging, comforting and urging you to be pleasing to God. So the love that must be present and strong, we must have that love uh, because only in relationship that we know what to do and how to do it so sometimes it's, uh, it is comfort that we must bring. Uh, other times there must be encouragement. Other times it's instruction. But uh, it's based on the care that we have for the, uh, for the person. We deal with each one of you as a father deals with his own children. Paul said. So the question is that does anybody care? Um, this is a song that asks that question. Does anybody care? And we think somehow this question is easy to answer in the church, but it does not very often. Uh, and we must recover that. We must uh, be uh, people who uh, deal with uh, burdens and concern and uh, bring focus to the solution that is in God. So we must be real first, we must believe first, we must practice first, and secondly, we must have relationship, uh, we must care, uh, so that uh, we can comfort and bring encouragement and instruction and uh, correction. So thirdly, he said uh, that, uh, that uh, it is not our opinion that we communicate. It is not our preference over things uh, like what to wear, what music to hear, what relationship to develop, uh, but uh, we uh, have the reason why we care. He said, we urge you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So how to live right with God is uh, why we care for people, why we uh, engage into their lives, why we speak into their situation. We ought to be effective for his calling and his purpose. Now, there are a lot of people in our church uh, that shows care, that live out the care burden of the church, and I'm very grateful to those who care for the church. No, not uh, the church in the generic sense, but uh, uh, in terms of its people. Uh, so it's a very encouraging and very uh, invigorating when we see leaders who care for the people. When we uh, see that, uh, that uh, they are sensitive enough to know when to bring shame and when not to. Uh, but they're always uh, uh, courageous to stand up for the truth and uh, hold people to accountability. But at the same time, we see the love and care from a growing relationship, and you understand that uh, that, uh, that is the basis uh, for a correction and for, uh, for, 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 uh, for helping people. 
So Paul said, I uh, do, do, don't write this to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. And uh, our regret is that there are few and far between those who would do this uh, to build up the church. So uh, we look into the uh, critical situation in the church of Corinth. We see why uh, the, this is a tremendous need. Why it is a crucial need. Why it is a critical need to have spiritual men who are burdened by the condition of the church, uh, who by the virtue of their life uh, in following Christ can demand that people change and follow them. Uh, we will see that in, uh, in the next uh, few points. Uh, but uh, to follow them, to change with them uh, to, in order to be more like Christ. So in the church of Corinth, after Paul and Apollos and Peter, there are many other leaders. But uh, it seems they don't love the church. Uh, they don't care about the spiritual condition. They are satisfied with the surface stuff, with appearance, with numbers, with self-importance, with their own agenda. And the church slides into the brink of destruction and God's people live a dangerous delusion that uh, stunted their growth and robbed them the joy and effectiveness for God. So Paul said uh, there is reproof in the life of the church uh, he said, uh, I write this in to sh uh, not to shame you, but to admonish you. I write this in to admonish you uh, because I love you uh, and because I have a relationship with you as my children. Uh, so, so, so the church must uh, be able to deal with reproof and to respond to reproof and to change and to take correction uh, for transformation that God brings into the church. So we want to focus on this point as uh, uh, how to build a church in time of trouble, how to deal with the issue of value system that we have in the church. Uh, and we understand that, uh, that as we have reproof in the life of the church, you need to uh, reprove people at times uh, and you need to also receive reproof at times. It is a spiritual burden. It is something that when you see something is wrong in the church, you don't just ignore it. And you take it on as your burden, take it on as your own responsibility to change, to bring transformation, to bring people to God, to lead them to the right relationship with God. So again, uh, let, let us ask ourselves, do we have that burden? Do we have burden for anybody else besides our own problem? Do we have burden to change the church and to contribute to its growth? And... Uh, and uh, to uh, deal with uh, the shameful situation at times in the church. So he said that we don't have intention to shame people. We don't point things out to make them feel ashamed. But uh, there's a place for shame uh, in the, uh, dealing with the word of God so that they can come to repentance. So uh, there must be um, admonishment. There must be reproof. Uh, it's got to be to, done in love uh, because it shows that uh, there are those God put in the church to care for the church to deal with this critical need. But the message that we hear often in the church is that you are okay, I'm okay, we are okay. Uh, well, we're not okay. That is just encouraging lies in the church uh, and, and encourage dishonesty and, uh, and delusion, uh, untruth. Uh, but we must ask people and confront people with the question, uh, are you living above the word? Do you exceed uh, the, the, what is written? Uh, are you uh, living on the foundation of grace? Or are you living in the system of works and marriage and comparison between you, uh, between uh, uh, one another? Uh, do you live with the mission and the purpose of the kingdom? And if, uh, if the answer is no, then, then there must be relationship uh, close enough, there must be uh, uh, love strong enough, there must be care deep enough to say that you must face up with this situation. You must uh, face with the word, you must deal with grace, you must answer the question of the purpose and mission of your life because that is what we are called to do. So, so, so that's uh, the first part that the marks of a, a spiritual man in dealing with the needs of the church. Uh, you uh, be the channel of God to bring reproof into the church. 
And, and like we said, it's not something that we, we, uh, we, we take lightly. Uh, we want to put in mind uh, people uh, so that they be thinking about the, the Word of God. But uh, we must uh, uh, live it out first. We must uh, practice in our life first. And we must show love. And we must share the burden that is in the heart of the Holy Spirit working uh, through the channel He put in the church so that the church can be corrected and strengthened and be strong. Now we will uh, we'll stop here uh, and uh, leave the rest uh, for, the, for the next uh, few weeks and that the marks of the spiritual man uh, uh, reprove, beget. Now that is to give birth and we will look into what, what it means. Uh, uh, the, the mark of, the spiritual, of a spiritual man is to model to give example and to discipline. But let's just uh, focus uh, as we look into our situation today. Do you have the burden to bring transformation into the church life, starting with your own life, uh, starting with the life uh, of those who are connected to you immediately, um, and bring the spirituality uh, uh, from the word, from scripture, into their life in the real way uh, in, in, and if you need conf confrontation you would do that and need correction you would do that uh, need understanding you would teach that uh, so that people may be changed for God and then we know that uh, we also need to receive reproof and instruction are we willing to receive are we willing to uh, uh, be taught and be changed and be transformed. And the answer that God wants us to, to, uh, to come to Him is that yes, we need change and we need grace and we need your power and work that through the church and work that through us uh, for the connection that you give to us to live out the value of the kingdom. So for this reason, He said, uh, I write to you not to shame you but to admonish you as my beloved children. Let's do that together and build up the church.